If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Psalm 133 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edges of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, mountains coming down from the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Now verses 2 and 3 certainly go into the, some Old Testament uh, text and some Old Testament history, but focus specifically this morning, I'd like for you to, on, on verse number 1. Verse number 1, you don't have to understand how the history of the Old Testament, the history of the Israelites, the, some certain events that, that happen. Verse number 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. You understand that. You know that. You can recognize that perhaps in your family, perhaps in the church, perhaps at work with, with people that you have to, to regularly interact with, you know how good and how pleasant it is when people dwell together in unity. And you know that's so good because you've probably been parts of groups where that hasn't been the case before where people have not got along, where there's been differences of opinions or personalities or whatever other issues there might have been going on. You know how not good, how bad that is, how unpleasant that can be. This morning, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, if you want to turn there. We'll, we're going to skim through Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, read some verses there, just Ephesians 3 and 4 actually. Uh, notice some, some things that are very important, and I want to remind you of some things. Here, the book of Ephesians is written from God through Paul to the church at Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus, these are Christians that he's talking to, but as we read these verses here in a few moments, I want you to, to recognize that there, there must have been some issues there must have been some things going on at the church at Ephesus because there's, a, there's clearly some things that God, through Paul, is trying to address that, that they don't quite have right. That they're not treating others exactly the way, not Paul wants them to, but God wants them to. And they needed to be reminded of these things. These are Christians. These are not people who, who are lost, who, who need to, to learn how to treat each other. These are people who are Christians, who should know how to treat each other, who should know better, but they're not doing the right thing. And they needed to be reminded of these things. Sweet Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, my faithful followers of Christ, perhaps maybe we need to be reminded of these things from time to time as well. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's start in verses 14 through 21. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. The, the first part of chapter 3, uh, Paul is talking about all the, the sacrifices and the difficulties that he's going through. And, and he tells them, don't, don't feel sorry for me because of these difficulties. We, we know Paul, the, the great missionary of the New Testament, he experiences some very terrible things in his life uh, because of the cause of Christ. But he, he's telling them here, don't feel bad for me because of these things. I'm, I'm doing these things for you. I'm doing these things for God, but I'm doing these things for you because you are my glory. You, 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 you are the things that, that I can look to God and say, yes, God, I, I played a role in, in this. You allowed me to, to help these people become Christians. And I'm thankful for you. And because of that, I'm, I'm willing to go through these difficulties if it means that you're going to remain faithful. Think about Paul had a mind like Christ. Christ made sacrifices for who? For everyone. Paul here is saying to the church at Ephesus, I, I'm willing to make these sacrifices because I know it helps to strengthen you. And then notice what he says in verses 14 through 21. For this reason, what we just talked about, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend. He wants us to comprehend with all the saints, with all the church, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of what? And to know the love of Christ. He says, I want you to understand. I want you to see in, in me and my sacrifice. I want you to, to see and understand with, with your relationship with one another, the, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth, the, the fullness 
of the love of Christ. Verse 19 again, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. It's hard for us to understand how much God loves us. Whoever you love the most in this world, God loves everyone in this world more. It's hard for us to grasp that, isn't it? You love your spouse, you love your children, you love that, that, you know, even our children might make it difficult sometimes to love, but you love that newborn baby because they haven't ever done anything wrong, and you, you love them tremendously. You love them with everything you've got. God loves everyone in this world, those who love him and those who hate him, much more than that. It's hard for us to grasp God's love, but Paul says to the church at Ephesus, I want you to understand God, God's love is immense. It surpasses knowledge. The second part of verse 19, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That's a powerful verse. We, we, it starts out with the, the power of God far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. God can do more than you ask. God can do more than you can imagine, but where is that power at work? Within this feeble old body, within this imperfect life, the power of God, God has decided to use us as the conduit for that power. We are the people who show the world the power of God. Verse 21, to him, to God, be glory where? In the church. In the church body as a whole worldwide, in the church that meets here at Charlotte Avenue, in the church that is you as a Christian, let the glory of God be in you and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Those are powerful verses. We could, we could take, uh, you know, three or four lessons, uh, three or four sermons, uh, a week-long you know, week gospel meeting just from those, those verses. But I want to remind you of that that, that, that Paul is willing to make this sacrifice for the church, that we need to be making sacrifices for the church to help one another understand the love of God because it is in us that God has decided to display that love today through our obedience to Christ Jesus. Look at verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, because of everything we just talked about, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, I beg you to walk, to live in a ma manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility. And he's talking again. Who's he talking to? To Christians. Relating, you'll we'll see here shortly, not necessarily relating so much to how we treat people in the world, but how we treat each other. Live a life, a manner, a walk, worthy of the manner with which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just also as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all, and in all. The unity that is supposed to exist within the church, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Notice some things that are necessary from those, those six verses in order to make that happen. We've got to be patient with each other. We've got to be humble towards each other. We've got to be gentle towards each other. We've got to uh, be diligent to preserve the unity that exists. That means it's not always going to happen just, just naturally. We've got to be diligent to preserve it, to hold on to it, to make sure that it lasts. There will be times when it's not easy to love each other. It's not easy to do the things, that, to treat the, each other the way we're supposed to treat each other. And we're going to talk about more of that as we go on. Look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4. And he, God, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers. So verse 11 talks about he, he gave different talents to different people and different roles to, to different groups of people. And th there's differences among us. Not everyone uh, of us sh should do this certain job or, or that certain job. You have talents that you need to use for God's glory. And they're not necessarily the same as the talents that I have. But I still need to use my talents for God's glory. Whatever you're good at, whatever abilities or talents or uh, whatever it might be, opportunities that you have, you need to use those for God's glory. And they're probably going to be different than the ones that I have. But notice verse 12. That's the important part. He gave all of these things to, to different people, different talents, different abilities, different opportunities. Why? 
for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to building up to the body of Christ. You have what you have because God gave it to you, and he wants you to use it to build up the body. Let's keep going. Verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. That's important. Who's the head of the body? Christ is the head of the body. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So if you put verses 11 and 12 and verses 15 and 16 together, here's what you get. You have a talent, you have an ability that is probably different than most everybody else. There may be a few people who have similar talents. I'm not the only person here who can preach, you know that. Uh, but you have different talents. I have different talents. We, we have those talents. We have those opportunities. We have those abilities. Uh, and we use those, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Then we go to verse 15 and 16, especially, well, verse 15, Christ is the head of the church. That's the important, important part there for this morning. Verse 16, for, even through Christ, or through Christ, the whole body is being fitted and held together by what? By what every joint or every part of the body supplies. That means I'm important. Not because I'm the preacher, but because I'm a Christian. And that means you're important because you're a Christian. Whatever your talent is, whatever your ability is, by what every joint supplies. What if you don't supply what you're supposed to be supplying? The body suffers. According to the proper working of each individual part, that's what I just said. If you don't supply what you're supposed to be supplying, if you're not properly working, if your life with God isn't right in the church, then not only do you suffer, but the church suffers. And if when, when, we, when every joint supplies the proper work that it's supposed to be doing, that causes the growth of the body and the building up of itself in love. Then finally, look at verses 26 through 32. 26 through 32. Again, uh, we, we look at this verse, especially verse 26, about being angry. A lot of times we get angry with, with uh, people in our lives, right? You know, maybe at your job, there are people who are frustrating, and it's easy to get angry with them. Uh, I was at a, a group of people yesterday, and I struggled with anger. Uh, I didn't sin. I, I followed the verse. I was angry, but I did not sin. Uh, but, but I struggled with, with being angry about some things. There was somebody who was just acting foolish. Uh, and and I, I struggled with, with some anger. We, we get angry sometimes, and that's in and of itself is not a sin. But oftentimes we think about this verse and we say, I got, a, I got an anger problem, I got an, uh, an anger issue, and maybe that comes along with, with people that we work with, especially I, I imagine I don't get angry at Jennifer very often. Uh, she's pretty good. Uh, but um, but we, we have this, this issue perhaps with, with people in our lives that we come in contact with every day who are not Christians. But what's the context of what we're talking about here? Being angry with Christians. So keep that in mind as we, as we look at this, verses 26 through 32. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. What does that mean? If you let the sun go down on your anger, you're giving Satan an opportunity to affect your life, your spiritual life, in a negative way. Verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will, say, say, will have something to share with one who has need. So there the specific example was given of stealing, but the point, the application is, if you have this sin in your life, don't do it anymore. Instead, do what you ought to be doing. So the person who steals is stealing because they're not working, and they feel like they have to steal in order to be able to provide, maybe for their family or for themselves, or, or maybe even they think for the church. Stop doing what you shouldn't be doing. Start doing what you should be doing. Be that joint that is properly working, doing the things that you know you ought to be doing. Verse 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that you will give grace to those who hear. Your words are powerful, and you need to think about what you say and how you say it, and when you say it, and to whom you say it. And again, this is talking about our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, Christians, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Again, the, all of that applies to our relationship with non-Christians, but it's not talking about that. It's talking about how we treat our brothers and our sisters in Christ, and we need to be mindful of these things. A, a couple of verses that I want to point out from that. Ephesians 3.21 
to him, to God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The point of the church is to provide glory to God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, walk talks about uh, walking worthily with all humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance and love, being di- diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Those are actions and ways that we need to treat one another. And then Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 reminds us that the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, When you do what you're supposed to do, and I do what I'm supposed to do, and everybody does what we're supposed to do, then the church will grow. When you don't, the church won't grow as it should. When I don't, not because I'm the preacher, but because I'm a Christian, the church won't grow as it should. All of us have a role to play, and when we don't play that role, the church suffers. Christians needed to be reminded of this. 2,000 years ago. Christians need to be reminded of this today. I want to go through a a, a few groups of people this morning that we need to be mindful about and keep all of this that we've read in in Ephesians uh, in mind as we talk about that. The church will always be made up of these groups and others. I didn't, it's not an exhaustive list, but the church will always be made up of the needy and the wealthy. Sometimes Perhaps if, if you're in need, if you're not as well off as you, you, you would think, and, and maybe even incorrectly, but people who are not in need look at the needy and say, well, what do they have to offer? Let me remind you that some of the best examples of being Christ-like in the Bible were poor people. You remember the widow's might. She gave all that she had, and Jesus recognized that. You remember the Macedonians, when we talk about giving and and, and giving to the needs of the saints, how is it that they give? They give out of their poverty, they're they're in poverty, and they give beyond their means. It's not that they're wealthy and they give a little extra. It's that they don't have anything and they give everything. They give beyond what they can actually give. They they suffered in in, in, in this collection specifically that's talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, when uh, there's a a need for the church in Jerusalem and and the whole church and the whole world basically is trying to help the, the, the saints in Jerusalem. He says specifically about the Macedonians, Paul does, God does through Paul, that they gave, they gave willingly, not out of their abundance, but out of their poverty, and in their poverty, they were struggling financially. They gave more than than they could. They gave beyond their means. The church will always have the needy, and it will always have the wealthy. And we look sometimes to the wealthy, and we say, wow, imagine imagine all the things that, that that person can do for God. We're also reminded in Scripture that some of the worst examples of people who should follow God are the wealthy. And This one would apply to more of us than the needy. Most of us in this room are wealthy, maybe even by American standards, but certainly by worldly standards. Certainly by the the rest of the world, we're, we're all pretty wealthy. The rich young ruler, he went away grieving. Why? Because he owned much, and he was unwilling to give it up. Mark chapter 10 and verse 22. He, was, he owned a lot, and he was not willing to give it up. But we also see the, the value or the, the good that can be provided by the wealthy. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 45, it says, They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them all with anyone uh, as anyone might have need. So, so those who had uh, property, those who had possessions, those who had accumulated some sort of wealth, they were willing to give it up to help other people. So if you don't have a whole lot of financial security, a whole lot of financial tools. Can you please God? Yes. If you do have a whole lot of financial security, if you're extremely blessed financially, can you please God? Yes. Philippians chapter 4 verse 12 and 13 teaches us that we can be pleasing to God in little and in much. The church will always be made up of the needy and the wealthy because the church needs both because both need Jesus. Secondly, the church will always be made up of the sick and the healthy. It's important, I think, for us to think about, you know, especially we all have sicknesses at various times. But when I'm talking about the sick here, I'm talking specifically about those who 
who have long-term illnesses, perhaps uh, our shut-ins. We've got a list of uh, probably six, seven, eight folks that uh, either individuals or, or couples, families uh, that are shut in. And, and the reality is you never see them on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or very rarely. The reality is, though, they still have a purpose. And they still have a role to play in the church. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 10. You know these verses. These, these folks that, that maybe we, we don't see very often, they still have a purpose and a role in the church. Hebrews 10, uh, 23 through 27. <clears throat> Again, you know these verses, especially verse 25. Uh, but let's, let's look at these. 23 through 27. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He says, hold on to what you believe because God is going to do what he said. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let's think about how we can help each other. Verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hold fast that confession because God is faithful. Let's think about one another. How can we help one another? Let's don't forsake getting together because when we get together, that's when we encourage one another. The, the getting together of Christians is really important. Verse 26, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Why is it important that you come to services as much as you can? Why is it important that you gather with other Christians as much as you can? Not just Sunday mornings. Because when Christians get together, if they're doing the right thing, they encourage one another to do the right thing. And if we don't have that encouragement, then it's possible that we'll go on sinning willfully. And if we go on sinning willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of the judgment to come. Now, we understand generally this is applied to those who forsake the assembly. Let me say that the shut-ins are not forsaking the assembly. But what I want us to think about is that we don't forsake the shut-ins. They still need Jesus. They still need you. They still need me. A lot of our shut-ins, a lot of you know very well and have had relationships with them that lasted a long time. When's the last time you thought about them? When's the last time you called them or wrote them a card or visited them? Listen, we, we would say that it would be very difficult based on these verses for someone to be a Christian and not be at services or not be at gatherings of the church. Amen? We would say that would be difficult. It would be more difficult because they wouldn't have that encouragement. I think we would agree with that. Perhaps you would, maybe not. I'd still say it's difficult for someone to remain a faithful Christian if they're not connected to the church, even if they're shut in. And it's our job as people who are not shut in, who people who can still get around, to go to them and make sure they still have that connection. I'm not perfect at that by any means. There are people that I don't visit as much as I should, but I'm not the only one that should visit. I encourage you, I challenge you, as I challenge myself, to make sure that we keep those Christian connections, even with people who can't be here, on Sundays or Wednesdays or other opportunities. The church is also made up of the healthy, thankfully, right? You're happy to be healthy, amen? All right, so uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you will say, I have no delight in them. There, no, there may be some, a, a number of applications from Ecclesiastes 12.1, but I think part of it is the fact that there comes days where you're not healthy, when you're not enjoying life. And, and maybe that has to do with age specifically, but, but I think what we, what we can take from this when we think about healthy folks is while you're healthy, while you have the opportunity, while you're not shut in, while you're not shut down because you're sick, make sure you take advantage of the opportunities that you have. Physical limitations do not limit spiritual value. Physical limitations do not limit spiritual value, and we need to remember that, and while we have the physical ability, we need to make sure that we use it. Thirdly, the church will always be made up of those who weep and those who rejoice. We know that we're told to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. In second, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, we've, we've talked about this verse uh, quite a bit recently uh, with thinking about those who have passed away, family members or, or members here at our congregation. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 tells us that we don't have to grieve as the rest do without hope. 
but it is important and it is good and it is okay to grieve. There are those this morning who are grieving. Those are those this morning who are not happy, who are going through difficulty. And it's okay to do that. It's okay to do that in, in whatever way you choose to do that, but to also recognize that it's okay to hope. It's okay to, to be positive even in doubt, even in difficulty. It's okay to, to have that hope in your life. That's what First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 tells us. And then Romans 12, 15 that I referenced earlier. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There are some of you here this morning that have a lot of things to be happy about. Uh, maybe you have new children in your family. Maybe you've got a, a new job. Maybe you, maybe teenagers, maybe you made a good grade this week. Hope so. Uh, maybe you made you know, a, a successful thing at, at your job. And there are things that you can be happy about, and, and that's good. And we should be happy with you. We need to, to guard against jealousy, right? James 3.16 says, Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is a disorder in every evil thing. Let's make sure that we're not naive enough to think that that can't happen in the church. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. I don't think disorder or every evil thing should be a part of the church. So we have to guard against jealousy and selfish ambition even within the church. But in our joy, when it is okay to, to be joyous, let's also be mindful. Because this morning, let me tell you who's here. This morning, there are people who are happy. There are people who are sad. There are people who are stressed out of their minds, and there are people who don't have a care in the world. There are people who are struggling, and there are people who are doing well. And we all need to be here, and we all need one another to be here. We need each other. Whether you're rejoicing or whether you're weeping, it is good, and we all need to be here. Next, the church will always be made up of people who have type A personalities and type B personalities. And if there is such a thing, type C personalities. There are people who will be motivated to, to get things done and to get them done now. And there will be people who will, be, will have the thought process. They won't be motivated to think this way, I guess, because they're not motivated. But they'll, they'll have the thought process of, well, we'll get to that eventually. No worries, no problem. Let me say it's, it's good that we have both of those people. Think of a church that was just type A personalities. I don't want to be there. Think of a church that's just type B personalities. You will never get anything done. It is good that we have people who are type A and type B or whatever other type of people there might be. That's okay. We all, there are people who are motivated, and there may be some of us who need to be motivated a little bit more, but it's okay for us to be different. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about there, the mind of Christ, and we won't take the time to, to reference it. I encourage you to read it sometime, 1 Thessalonians 2. It talks about the mind of Christ. Here are some points from that. The mind of Christ is different than the mind of the world. Secondly, the mind of Christ must be developed within Christians, and we as Christians can have that mind. And even when all of us, even if all of us were to have the mind of Christ, we would still have different personalities. And that's okay. I don't have to be like you. I have to be like Jesus. And if I ever think you have to be like me or I have to be like you, then I've got it wrong. I've got to be like Jesus. And in my being like Jesus, if I have the mind of Christ, if I have the approach of Christ, I can do that as a type A, a type B, a type C, whatever it might be. I can be like Christ and have a different personality than you. Next, and these next three are, are all somewhat related. Uh, they have to do with uh, age or experience, uh, but they're somewhat related, so it may be a little bit redundant, but they're, they're slightly different, I think, too. Next, uh, the church will always be made up the, of the elderly and babies. We think about the elderly, they are oftentimes the foundation of a congregation. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32, almost from the very beginning of the Bible, from the very beginning of God's revealed word to people, notice the, the respect that God says we should have for those who are elderly. You shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged. Shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged. I know in our American culture it, it used to be uh, tradition or mindset or the way things were done. When, when uh, someone who is older walked into a room or walked into a table, you, you, you might stand for them. You might pay special attention to them. You might honor them in that way. I think that's what this is talking about. And, and perhaps we need to do that, that physical aspect. But, but the point of it is we need to honor those who have made it through this life to the point that they've made it and they're Christians. Those of you who are older, those of you who may not consider yourself elderly, but are of uh, that age, perhaps, 
Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for Christ and for his church and for this church. We appreciate you. And we need to do a better job of doing that. In the same way, in Psalm 71, verse 9, uh, David, I believe, writing here as an, an older man, he says, Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Older brothers and sisters in Christ, you still have value, just as much as the, the sick one still has value. If you're an older brother or sister in Christ, you still have value. You still have purpose. What about babies? Praise God for babies. I'm glad we have a lot of babies here. I, I know that there, there are issues uh, sometimes that when uh, babies cry out and they're, and they're loud and they're talkative and they drop things that, that uh, sometimes people get a little upset about that. Uh, and there's a balance there that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, but praise God that we have babies in this church. Because that means this church has a future in and of itself. And we want to, to reach the, the lost but we have a foundation for the future. Look at the children around you. Think about the children that are in this church. One day, there's a good chance they'll be leading singing. They'll be leading prayers. They'll be organizing ladies' days. They'll be helping with meals. They may be deacons or deacons' wives or elders or elders' wives. What do we need to do to make sure that when our children, our babies are the leaders of the church, that this church is still sound. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's not just for parents, though it does certainly directly relate to them, but it's also for you and I as Christians. Secondly, along the same lines, the church will always be made up of the young and the old. Uh, we've talked about this recently. Uh, we, we've shared these quotes before. These are not biblical quotes, but certainly mindsets that you and I can relate to. Uh, old folks, generally older folks, excuse me, uh, generally think youth is wasted on the young. They have so much physical, physical energy. But they don't know where to put it. They don't know how to, to use that energy. They don't know the, the best way to do it. They, they waste so much of that energy that if I just had a little bit of that energy, if I just had a little bit of that energy, imagine what I could do. And then older folks oftentimes think, and this may be just any one of a, uh, an experienced age, if I knew then what I knew now, if I had the energy that I had then with the wisdom that I had now, I'd be a dynamic force in my job. I'd be a dynamic force in my family. I'd be a dynamic, dynamic force for Christ. Help young people understand what they could and what they should do with their energy. If you have the experience but you don't have the energy, use your wisdom to guide the young. If you have the energy but you don't have the wisdom, Let's be wise enough to realize we don't have the wisdom. Let's be willing to listen to those who do. Thirdly, along these same lines, the church will always be made up of the new and the seasoned. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, they shall be satisfied. Uh, the folks who, who just become Christians, and I say the, the new here because some people don't become Christians at a young age. Lots of folks become Christians at older ages, but they're still new. They're still uh, immature in the faith. But they still have that same zeal, that same desire, that same passion. And for those of us who are seasoned, those of us who have been Christians for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years, you know God's Word, you've experienced God's Word, you've lived God's Word in your life. Follow 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 where Paul says to those Christians, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Paul invested. The, the most amazing thing I think about Paul, maybe not the most amazing thing, an amazing thing about Paul, is he invested in just about everyone he ever met. He invested in them time and energy and effort, and he was a busy man. He was an apostle of Christ. But it seems from Scripture that he invested in everyone. He took the time to invest in them. And, and one of the, the most frustrating and, and disappointing things I've ever witnessed in the church is when older folks say, well, I just don't relate to younger folks. And because of that, they don't invest in them. We're missing a big opportunity, and I think we're disobeying a command when we don't invest in other Christians when we've got the wisdom that they don't have. Provide direction. Fulfill the new or the young's desire to be righteous. Show them how and involve them in the work. And then lastly, and maybe most clearly, uh, the church will always be made up of men and women. 
Men, you've got a job to do. A church that doesn't have men doing what they're supposed to do isn't the church that God wants it to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, I think wraps up a little bit of an idea of what the job of all men in the church is. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all you do be done in love. Men, stand. Stand strong, stand in the truth, and stand in love. Now think about women in the church. I think about Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Actually, it's Ephesians, sorry. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, a verse that we, we read earlier. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. When I think about ladies, I think about this verse. Men are to be strong and to stand firm. And sometimes, and we're to do all things in love. It said there in that, that second verse that we read. But, but men generally, personality-wise, don't, don't share that, that empathy, that sympathy, that, that emotional connectedness uh, that, that women do. Men are important in the church, and a church that doesn't have men doing what they're supposed to do isn't the church that God wants it to be. Women are important, and they're important in the church. And when the church has women that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, the church isn't what God wants it to be. Women, I, I think one of the great services that you provide for the church is you help ensure this bond of love. And when there are struggles that, that the Bible addresses specifically to women, then there's issues. Some of those are gossip and envy and strife and perhaps passive-aggressive activity or thoughts or motives. Men are important in the church. Women are important in the church. All these other people are important in the church. And lastly, as I've ran, ran over time, we're going we're to wrap up here. The church will always have Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lots of folks want Jesus the Savior. Fewer folks want Jesus the Lord. He is the head of the church, as we've already read, and we'll read here a couple verses in just a second. But the, the church will always be headed not by men or by women, not by the, the needy or the wealthy, not by this group or that group. The church will always have one head and will always have one leader, and that is Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.18, He, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Does Christ have first place in everything in your life? And then to conclude, John 13, 12 through 15. John 13, 12 through 15. After Jesus has, has washed the disciples' feet, it says this. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Whether you're a man or a woman, you're wealthy or you're poor, or any of those other distinctions that we made, and there are many, many others, Jesus left all of us, no matter what our position or station in life is, an example, and that example was to serve one another. If you think that you're a leader, you'd better be a servant. If you want to be who God wants you to be, you'd better be a servant. And we need to think about one another as more important than ourselves. In, in Ephesus, the church there needed to be reminded of this. Perhaps this morning, you need to be reminded of that. Christians, if you're not doing what you ought to do, you can change. I can change. We can do what we should do. And if you need to make a change, make it this morning. Make it this morning in your, in your mind. Repent. Make a, make, change your mind that will lead to a change of action. If you've been doing things that you, you ought not to do or not treating people the way that you ought to treat them and you need to ask for forgiveness, we welcome you to do that. If you're not a Christian this morning, listen. Christians aren't perfect people, but Christians are made perfect by the blood of Christ. And you can have that this morning if you're willing to believe in Christ, confess Him as Lord and Savior of your life and as the Son of God, repent of your sins, and be baptized where you come into contact with the blood of Christ. If you have any need this morning, we encourage you and invite you to come as we stand and sing.